Our galaxy is an enormous place with billions of stars and doubtless billions of potentially habitable planets, yet a single Dyson Sphere contains as much living space as all of those planets combined. So today, we are talking about Dyson Spheres, giant constructs designed to take advantage of all the light produced by a star. This should be fairly familiar ground for anyone who is a regular to the channel, as we do talk about them a lot. We've talked about them in terms of the Fermi Paradox in the Dyson Dilemma. We've talked about them as the basis for what are known as Kardashev II Civilizations in the Kardashev Scale episode. We've talked about their individual components in terms of other megastructures like rotating habitats and orbital rings. We've talked about special purposes they can be put to, like moving a star via a shikata thruster or using one to toast planets thousands of light years away in the Nikol Dyson Beams episode. But we've never sat down and just discussed it in a dedicated fashion, and we'll do that today. One peculiar aspect of Dyson Spheres is that they don't make too many appearances in science fiction, especially film or TV, even though they are often considered a near-inevitable path that advanced civilizations would pursue, for reasons we'll get to shortly. Part of that avoidance in fiction is probably their sheer scale. These things are immense, and would dwarf Earth the way Earth dwarfs a small village. More in fact, a classic Dyson Sphere outfitted for human habitation is so large that if you randomly scattered every living human around one, they'd each have their own continent to themselves. On the other hand, most fictional planets tend to be shown to us as not much more than one town, simply because a fully populated planet is already a thing of overwhelming scope, and a Dyson Sphere that much more so. They are so big that even if you only gave a one-page summary atlas entry on every continent-sized area of one, it would require several million books and several thousand years to read. We are going to try to wrap our heads around some of that immensity today, but to do that, let's start with the basic concept. All life on this planet is fundamentally powered by the sun with only a tiny amount of our planetary energy budget deriving from geothermal energy provided by our molten core or the tidal heating the moon generates while orbiting us. That sunlight provides an incredible amount of energy, approximately 174,000 trillion watts of power, or 174,000 terawatts. Our own energy needs in terms of electricity are about a percent of a percent of that. We do consume a lot of energy, but it's nothing compared to what the planet receives constantly, though of course we use a lot of that indirectly to power our biosphere and heat our homes. A lot of that light is wasted, bouncing back into space or hitting barren land or sea. Even what little actually hits photosynthetic plants goes mostly unused, and while it does help us stay warm, it could do that just as well even if we used it for other productive purposes first. Whether you plug in a light bulb or a TV or a laptop or space heater, all that energy ends as heat, which is an important point to remember for later. A lot of energy hits Earth, and a lot is reflected away or blocked by clouds, plus any land devoted to solar power panels is land you can't use for something else, so folks often discuss the idea of putting solar panels in orbit and beaming that energy down. That's an ample and nigh inexhaustible supply too, but as tremendous as the amount of energy hitting our planet is, the Sun itself produces over 2.2 billion times the light that hits Earth, and a quadrillion times what we use to run our technology and civilization. You can kind of guess where this is going, except that where this is going seems to vary from person to person. What fiction tends to reference is a big solid spherical shell where people live on the inside, but that is not what Freeman Dyson, for whom the object is named, actually had in mind. In fact, he wasn't thinking of an object at all, and it's also never what I'm referring to on the channel either. 
Such a construct is virtually impossible to build, especially if you don't have some form of artificial gravity available, but there are other ways and we'll discuss them later. The original Dyson Sphere, typically known as a Dyson Swarm nowadays just to avoid any confusion, is really just a giant cloud of objects orbiting a star thickly enough to obstruct most or all of a star's light. It is easier to think of it as a solid spherical shell when contemplating the numbers. Such a sphere would generally have a radius of Earth's distance from the Sun, 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers, and an area of 2.8 times 10 to the 17th square kilometers. In terms of Earth, that is just over half a billion times the area, but it is actually 2.2 billion times as much area because the Earth receives an amount of sunlight based on its cross-section to the Sun, pi times the planet's radius squared, but has a surface area of 4 pi r squared. Only half the planet is lit at any time and most of it is angled off from the Sun, not perpendicular to its light. If the swarm was composed entirely of O'Neill cylinders, large rotating habitats 4 kilometers in radius and 20 kilometers long, with an internal area of 800 square kilometers, it would contain 350 trillion of them. An O'Neill cylinder is about as big as we can safely build a rotating habitat with modern materials, and such a habitat might be sparsely populated, a dedicated nature preserve, or home to millions. Also, while their rotation mimics gravity internally, they have virtually no real external gravity. This means you could easily position hundreds of them right near each other, bound together by cables for vacuum trains, or even long, thin, pressurized corridor habitats just thick enough to offer comfortable spin gravity to the traffic inside. These habitats, along with thin mirrors and solar panels to help supply them with light and electricity, tend to be considered the default constituents of a Dyson Sphere. Now as I mentioned, you can connect them, and indeed likely would, more on that in a moment, but let's assume each was on its own elliptical trajectory around the Sun. Now these are not planets, so they can maintain temperatures easier, twisting to expose more or less surface to the Sun or maneuvering solar shades or mirrors to block light or add more, so they do not need to be on anything like a normal Earth distance, they could be as close as Mercury or as far as Mars with no serious impediment to maintaining their function or climate. But if we assume for the moment they have to stick to within a 25 million kilometer zone closer or further than the Earth's average distance of 150 million kilometers from the Sun, the volume these habitats are inside would be about 10 to the 25th cubic kilometers, whereas each cylinder has 1600 cubic kilometers of volume, with some more space for various external attachments, and with 350 trillion of them, that would be close to a quintillion cubic kilometers, or 10 to the 18th, one ten millionth of the total value. These are all constantly moving, but if we took a quick snapshot of the system, on average each habitat would occupy a cube 3,000 kilometers or 2,000 miles to a side, with them at the center all by themselves. The system is essentially opaque, not because it is densely packed, but because it is so thick much as fog or clouds are, much as galaxies appear quite thick and hard to see through, even though stars are separated by distances even larger than Dyson spheres. So collisions are not an issue because they are not close to each other at all, folks tend to assume the various components are constantly in danger of slamming together because they are picturing something that is densely packed, but they aren't. Additionally, there are three things you can do with access to that much energy. You can power lots of radar, lots of computers, and lots of light beam propulsion, so they have no problem tracking each other, predicting trajectories, and making sure collisions don't happen, they can also vaporize any debris that wanders their way. A fourth thing they can do is run giant clocks. I get asked a lot in terms of the Fermi Paradox if one would actually expect big civilizations to do a lot of omnidirectional broadcasts. And the answer is no, even with access to tons of power you don't waste it, particularly since there are only so many frequencies to broadcast on, so you do a lot of tight beam communication, over actual wires or using lasers, and probably encrypted or compressed. But the one thing you would probably still broadcast in a loud and omnidirectional fashion 
is your positioning system. Everybody needs to know where they are and where everyone else is, not just your hundreds of trillions of habitats, but all your ships and smaller facilities as well, so you'd want to have a few channels devoted to just bulking out the time and date constantly, just like Earth's GPS system does. This is not absolutely necessary, but it is the most logical approach, and while a Dyson can be a single mega-civilization with a unified government, or trillions of separate individual nations of one or more habitats, that's one cooperative treaty that probably would raise little objection in being passed or enforced. Not that stuff would start slamming into each other if they did not, in all probability each habitat would be quite capable of tracking all of its trillions of neighbors and at most need to coordinate with a handful of others for total vision and tracking, but it saves a lot of resources if everyone is coordinating on an agreed upon system of what to do if two habitats are on an intersecting trajectory. This also answers the regular question of who would build such a thing, considering the time and resources needed, because you just build new components in open orbits as needed or wanted over time. You might build one over a decade or over the span of a million years, depending on your needs and capabilities, but you do have some reasons to build it faster than your population grows, more on that in a bit. As I said, they could be all scattered out, but generally probably will not be. A given orbital path, be it a circle or ellipse, can be thought of as a solid ring a habitat moves along. You can put many other habitats on that same ring and travel between those on that ring becomes incredibly easy, indeed you could make a solid ring too. Those familiar with Larry Niven's Ring Ward probably know that as a partial Dyson, and also know it's inherently unstable and has to spin so fast that no known material could handle the strain. If you did happen to have such a super material, you could enclose a star by just making several of them, each cocked at a different angle. However, those rings have to spin fast and are unstable because they are trying to simulate gravity via centrifugal force. The bigger an object is in terms of radius, the more quickly it must spin and the more force it must endure to produce the same amount of spin gravity, but you can just run a while right around a planet or star in a big loop, and it just orbits. That's not super stable, but it's decently stable and easily corrected. Indeed, that's the basis of the orbital ring we discussed last week, and as I mentioned at the time, you could supersize those to run around stars, not just planets. We have a type of megastructure called a rung world, which is like a ring world but looks more like a ladder wrapped around in a circle, in this case around the Sun. The individual rungs of the ladder are rotating habitats, each connected in that circle by either a cable or even a full-blown one-loop Topopolis, a kind of super long thin rotating habitat we've discussed in passing before. Such a rung ward might be a series of a million O'Neill cylinders connected by a pair of cables, one used for clockwise movement between rungs and the other counterclockwise perhaps, or it might be even more upscaled, if you have bulk graphene manufacture and be two topopolises connected by thousands of McKendry cylinders acting as rungs. It depends on your level of technology. Obviously, if you can bulk produce high quality graphene, it lets you make much bigger habitats, and carbon, what graphene is made of, is a lot more plentiful than iron or titanium, the two things we usually envision making rotating habitats from. And whereas an O'Neill cylinder is basically a decent sized island populated by hundreds of thousands, a McKendry cylinder is a continent class megastructure that could comfortably house a billion people. They do not need to be connected, but this allows for easy and cheap travel, as well as dedicated transmission lines for power and high bandwidth communications among other things. These, rather than the cloud format, are probably your more logical basic subdivision of a Dyson Sphere. In the general swarm, your neighbors might be changing a lot, here however, your neighbors remain in the same position on that ring. That would give you a lot more throw weight in local disagreements too. It takes several million O'Neill cylinder rung boards to enclose a star, or several thousand McKendry rung boards, But even for a smaller one, it is probably better to be one of millions of larger entities than one of a few hundred trillion lone habitats. I usually refer to these entities as ladder states, 
I'm only guessing by assuming these might ever exist, but whether or not they do, it makes it easier to contemplate the internal workings of a Dyson Sphere. As I said, the scale of these things boggles the mind, so anything that makes them easier to wrap your mind around helps. Now one hardly has to jam-pack these things with people, but keeping to the modern human densities, we'd expect the average O'Neill ladder state to have a population of around a trillion, and a McKendry ladder state to be more like 100 trillion to a quadrillion. Don't think of these as local superpowers either, compared to a full Dyson Sphere, even a McKendry ladder state is essentially a micro-nation. Next to each ring or ladder state would be two more, one a little closer and one a little further from the Sun, cocked at an angle, probably a small one too, so they didn't have much relative motion to their neighbors when intersecting them. Each subsequent ring is tilted a little more and you wrap around to enclose a star. The individual rungs could be nearly touching their neighbors, or could be spaced out with solar panels and smaller facilities in between. Now the question always becomes where do you get the material for all of this? And by default the assumption is that you disassemble the planets to do it, but you don't actually have to. There are other ways to get the necessary material, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. Those planets also can cause a lot of orbital perturbations in your Dyson Swarm, but those can also be managed. There are basically two ways you can start a Dyson off, and both could occur simultaneously. The first is to begin near Earth, basically building a cloud of habitats around the planet, the planet cloud I've discussed before, and begin extending that out from Earth as the first ring. Earth is pretty massive so you've got issues with it pulling elements on the ring towards itself, but this is manageable. Indeed if you've got bulk graphene production and orbital rings and space towers, you can actually include Earth as a rung itself and use active support to push near rungs away to neutralize gravitational attraction. Subsequent rings might spawn from other planets like Mars or Venus, as they were terraformed, or just near Earth, again at an angle. These rings can be pretty wide too. The further you get from the actual line of orbit, the more the material is pulled toward a different orbit, but that can be a pretty big distance even before conventional materials can't handle the strain, and materials like carbon nanotubes or active support members widen that a lot more. Nor do the rungs need to be tilted perpendicular to the Sun, they could parallel sunlight or be cocked onto the orbital path, and you can get away with structures that are more three-dimensional than just a ladder wrapped in a circle. Your other starting point is near the Sun. Mercury is not classically terraformable, we can paraterraform it, but it is usually considered a far better candidate for raw materials. To create an entire sphere of mirrors and solar panels around the Sun, requires not even a percent of Mercury's mass, hopefully less since ideally a power-focused early Dyson would actually be composed of power statites, not power satellites, and those have to be quite thin. A statite, which is short for static satellite, is a type of simple active support structure. It is a very thin object light enough to float over the Sun. It is pushed away by solar radiation, equal but opposite to the pull of gravity essentially like floating a sheet of paper over an air vent, or a heavy version of a solar sail. Since both the outward force of the Sun's light and the pull of gravity decrease with the square of distance from the Sun, a statite functions the same at any distance from the Sun, and each star has a specific density a statite must have to float. Too light and it blows away, too heavy and it falls into the star. Interestingly, the bigger stars permit heavier statites because while they have more gravity than smaller stars, they also produce vastly more light. A star twice as massive has twice the gravitational force, but will be at least ten times as bright. Also, statites can make use of solar wind to increase the mass they can carry, and one can combine normal orbital methods with these to produce something I call a lagite, or lagging satellite one that orbits slower than normal by combining the solar push with the normal orbital mechanics, allowing decently heavier objects to orbit at a desired speed rather than the natural one. The exact mass density will vary from star to star, but for ours it is 0.78 grams per square meter, thicker and it falls down, lighter and it flies away. 
built at Earth's distance, a shell of statites around the whole Sun would mass 2.2 times 10 to the 20th kilograms, which sounds like a lot but Earth itself is 27,000 times as massive, nor does it need to be that big, it's just meals so you could build it much closer to the Sun, smaller shell, less mass. Now such panels would not just be thin meals, you want to be able to expand or contract them a little, or turn them in angles, as the Sun does not produce exactly the same light all the time, so they'd probably be thin films with some wires or small computer and a counterbalance or gyro so that you can adjust their size, position, and attitude. This makes them all able to maneuver too, or tilt briefly out of the way to let sunlight pass through to hit the Earth for instance, as it passed behind one. This setup is preferable to a single mass of thin film, though that is one way to make a classic single piece Dyson spherical shell. So we now have a ton of power collectors around the Sun, without having to totally disassemble even Mercury. This brings up the question of, what do you do with all that power? which is different than what you do with all that space. I consider the answer to the latter, what you do with 2 billion times the living area of Earth, to be rather obvious. All that power though is another animal. You can't beam it back to Earth, it would blow the planet up, and indeed we did an episode discussing weaponizing a Dyson Sphere, a construct known as a Nyko Dyson Beam. So you have a huge amount of power, what do you use it for? We have a lot of options. If you've managed to design solid gamma ray lasers, grazers, you ought to be able to create small artificial black holes by firing tons of them at the same spot, something known as a Kugelblitz black hole, which make amazing batteries able to hold energy for trillions of years or more, or power starships capable of moving at a decent fraction of light speed, or powering space stations and habitats far from the sun. That's pretty high tech but does seem permissible under known physics, if anyone can figure out a way to reflect gamma rays, the way we reflect normal light. You can also use all that energy to power miniaturized Nyko Dyson beams to push even very large ships to interstellar velocities, or around your own solar system, as we discussed in the Interstellar Highways episode. Either way, the creation of such a power-only Dyson even just a partial one gathering less than a percent of a percent of the sun's light, makes you an interstellar civilization, no new technology required. We can also use that power to run a star lifting process, we did a whole episode on that but to quickly recap, the sun contains more matter by far than everything in the solar system combined, and that includes heavier materials like carbon and ion. There are thousands of Earth's worth of such materials in the Sun, and they are all over the Sun, not just buried in the core. Extracting those is quite the Herculean endeavor, but it's not super high tech, and the Sun itself powers the extraction process. See that episode for details, but that is one way to get the material you need for a more robust Dyson without disassembling planets. You only have to extract from planets, asteroids, and moons what you need to get started. The other option is to make heavier elements out of lighter ones. We have been researching fusion for some time now, and we talk about how much of a game changer or practical commercial fusion would be for our civilization, but it does not render a Dyson Sphere redundant, nor do you need it to make one or transmute materials. When you fuse lighter elements, like hydrogen or helium, into heavier ones like carbon or oxygen, you release a lot of energy. Our problem isn't doing this, fusion is actually quite simple, it's doing it without needing something as big as a star and breaking even. Right now we have to pour more energy into matter than we get out of it if we want to fuse lighter elements into heavier elements. Such a civilization might just have fusion reactors robust enough to not only fuse deuterium, but also go as far up the chain as iron and get a massive surplus of energy out of it. If they can't do that, then they can opt to use that huge surplus of power from their thin early Dyson to power huge particle accelerators that run at a deficit but produce heavier elements. Again, not high tech, just massive. So by this technique or by star lifting, you can get the necessary heavy elements to build a bigger, thicker Dyson. Indeed, any star, 
even one with no planets locally, just maybe a few rocks to start the process, can be made into an optimum Dyson. The material needed for any Dyson is related to the total luminosity or power of the star it surrounds, twice as bright, twice the material to enclose it. If you are plucking matter from a sun and it's not enough for your purposes, you just keep transmuting more hydrogen and helium into heavier elements, drawn from that sun, and its brightness begins to go down, decreasing the amount of material you need for full enclosure until you hit the optimum balance. You can even arrange to leave planets in orbit around it unaffected by having your various power collectors or habitats tilt out of the way when they block it or have some mirrors rotate to focus more light on it, keeping that planet to its normal daylight levels. So you could build one around an alien system where intelligent critters are just thinking about how handy fire is, and when they developed real technology, you could just offer them the Dyson as a gift and effective back rent. You've already got millions of years of use out of it, and if you did have the ability to make Kugelblitz black holes, you'd probably just build a small power collector Dyson to store that energy up and carry it home. You can also use this technique to take very large stars and lower their mass until they won't go supernova, thus killing off any nearby life, and walk away from that with several million planets worth of heavy matter for construction elsewhere as a reward for your good deeds. It's much more efficient getting heavy elements this way too, rather than the essentially tiny amount that normally forms planets. A supernova scatters matter out in every direction, with much of it remaining behind, trapped in the neutron star or black hole remnant. Of what remains, and reaches proto-solar systems forming, only a small fraction will end as a rocky planet, with more of it buried inside gas giants and even more inside the new sun in which case you have to star lift it out, which is hardly easy, see the star lifting episode for more details on that and other applications of that technology. Now I am generally of the opinion that any given Dyson will be a multi-task device, but there are a few types that are purpose built, a couple of which we've discussed in more detail elsewhere. The first is an obvious one, massive collections of rotating habitats for living area, or non-rotating ones if you've either adapted to zero gravity or invented artificial gravity. If the latter, you can actually build a classic Dyson shell, and use seriously upscaled orbital rings to keep it rigid. You'd probably include solar panels near or in to power those active support rings, keeping it rigid, and maneuver thrusters to keep it from meandering off thus allowing you to have nighttime too, since again the shell by default experiences constant noontime light. It also has no gravity, no spherical shell, no matter how massive, generates any net gravity inside it, not at the middle, not at the edges, that's just how the symmetry of spherical shells works. So everything would fall into the sun if you don't have some sort of artificial gravity, In Niven's Ring World we get this by taking a slice, a thick ring of a Dyson, and spinning it very fast. This doesn't work with a sphere though, since besides needing impossibly strong materials, the pores will still experience no gravity, and only at the equator would you have full gravity. That's actually okay if you just want a partial Dyson and don't mind gravity being weaker at some places and stronger near the equator you can still float a huge statite power collector over both poles. If you really want a rigid Dyson that you can walk around but had no artificial gravity, you would make such a sphere, spin it enough for a little gravity, and then have tons of rotating habitats connected to the skin which each spun so it looked like a big spiky ball. We will talk another time about how to make super large spinning habitats like ring wards using active support. But that's purpose number one replicating Earth. You could devote a planet's worth of space just to single biome serving as nature preserves, have a million Earth's worth of such nature preserves, and still only use a thousandth of your available space. You can also focus more on human living area by using the sunlight for more optimized plant growth via hydroponics, and have folks live in more urban or suburban garden setups akin to those discussed in the Arcologies and Ecumenopolis episodes. 
This dual mix is probably more likely, nature preserves, suburban sprawls, and urban areas with some parks and lots of hydroponics. You can also genetically engineer life from the ground up to live in a vacuum environment and just let it set up its own nice and swarm. Although genetic engineering might be a stretch, since you might have to start from the ground up, not even using DNA or carbon as your basis. I'm not sure how practical that is, but I've always found the notion rather fascinating, and may discuss it more if I ever do an episode on space-based life, or life designed specifically to live in space. Emphasis on design because it's very unlikely to ever evolve on its own. Of course you can also use a lot of that energy to run totally artificial life and giant computers, and one focused entirely on that is called a Matrioska Brain, see that episode. You can also go the big laser option, the Nikol Dyson Beam, or the big transmutation version where you are trying to extract all the mass you can from a star and turn it into heavier elements. This has no official name so I just call it a Star Mine or Dyson Mine, and its cousin, the one that just stores power into miniature black holes, a Kugelblitzer or Kugelblitz Dyson. You can also tune one in its entirety to act as a giant transmitter, a stellar beacon, converting all that energy into ultra-powerful signals you could pick up galaxies away. You might use a few stars for doing this, as a sort of galactic positioning system, if you had an interstellar civilization, since a galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars so you have a few to spare. Lastly, you can use them to move stars, a version known as a Shikana Thruster. That has its own episode too, but in short form you build a half Dyson, typically of statites, the Dyson Bubble, and cause the sunlight to emit all in one direction, providing thrust in the opposite direction. The star provides the thrust and holds onto the satellites, including natural ones like planets, with its own gravity. This, along with star lifting, are good ways to prevent big stars blowing up near your civilization either by mining them down in mass or moving them to a safe distance. By default, a Dyson Sphere would be all of these at once, but there are advantages to specializing in one specific ability. Any Dyson Sphere can move itself by reflecting its light asymmetrically, or star lifting matter off the sun to spray in one direction as a big rocket engine. Any of them can power rotating habitats for people or nature preserves. Any of them can generate huge beams that can move starships around locally or to interstellar distances, or upscale them further to blow planets apart light years away. Any can run vast networks of computers or transmutation farms or power storage depots or interstellar highways. I would tend to assume you would do all of these simultaneously. An early Dyson is a thin one being used mostly for power and heavy matter creation or extraction, as time goes on it replaces power collection with habitats, unless you go all digital, in which case those habitats are enormous processors and data banks. The Matrioska Brain, which also has its own episode, is the classic example of this computer-focused Dyson taken to the extreme, or at least the extreme using classic computing and just one star. We will discuss something using reversible computing next week. All of these concepts work around using a star as the central fuel source for some sort of engine or system, which is why these are also often called stellar engines. But even if you have better methods of power generation than a star, you still extract that matter and energy to fuel those better methods instead, be it controlled fusion or raw matter to energy conversion. You also still make the swarm because you want to be fairly close to other people or entities to minimize travel time on matter and information, and that's as close as you can be without getting too hot. That's a big note, Dysons do not absorb energy from a star, they temporarily absorb it, use it, and radiate it away as heat, or light in lower frequencies like infrared. If you did not, you would fry everyone inside and the only way to avoid that is to be able to break the laws of thermodynamics, which also renders a Dyson unnecessary anyway. A Dyson is just as bright as the original star, only it will appear physically larger and more diffuse, glowing in the infrared range instead of the visual range of light. They also cannot be mistaken for any natural object, 
They look identical to some gas giants in the outer reaches of a solar system, but identical in the same way a grapefruit looks like a stall. They are roughly the same shape and color. Nobody with the technology to see either would ever mistake the one for the other, nor be fooled even momentarily by any method I have ever heard suggested for concealing a Dyson that did not require technologies not permitted under known science. This is not a Fermi Paradox episode, but Dysons were inextricably linked to the Fermi Paradox right from the get-go, so they tend to always make people wonder about it. I'm sure folks will ask about it in the comments, and by all means go ahead, you should be trying to think up loopholes, but please make sure to check the other comments first, odds are I will have already answered the question and it gets a bit repetitive explaining how they could never be made to look like cosmic background radiation and are not a candidate for dark matter. Ditto how civilizations might stop growing and not need one, or miniaturize and not need one. We covered all that in the Dyson Dilemma episode and its remake in more detail anyway. I always advise people to resort to common sense instead though. You generally only go out of your way to hide out of fear, and so you only hide a Dyson from something that is bigger or stronger than one, and since any Dyson civilization, a Karlsev II civilization, is quite capable of monitoring every single star in a galaxy, those contemplating building one know that anyone who already had one or better already knows where they live. On top of that, building a Dyson Sphere isn't exactly covert. It is kind of like trying to build a deep hidden bunker next to a town while using heavy machinery and explosives for excavation. Bigger, older civilizations will know you are there, and they will see you building it. So you can build one of these, more technology helps, but as soon as you can begin profitably doing any mining or construction in space, you have the technology to make one. They are not high tech any more than a city is, but like a city, more technology is better, and you can do a lot of R&D when a mere millionth of your population is 10 trillion people, and a millionth is about what we use for any minor subdiscipline of the sciences, like how many folks specifically study dolphins full time. You can see the Kardashev Scale episode for more explanation of the sheer scale of a civilization that large, and what it can do even without super technologies. They could basically beat the snot out of any classic galactic empire of millions of planets, since they have a billion planets worth of space back home. Just one of those latter states, even an O'Neill sort of variety, keeps around the kind of resources and population that matches most fictional interstellar empires. But I personally doubt they'd tend to be monolithic, more likely hundreds of various coalitions ranging from fairly centralized ones to loose coalitions with self-defense and trade treaties, possibly even totally independent entities that cooperate with their neighbors no more than agreeing not to shoot them, or block their light or ram into them, your guess is as good as mine. Fundamentally though, this is what we expect all technological civilizations to tend to converge towards, barring any radical changes in our understanding of physics. You'd probably have tons of smaller conglomerations of structures far out in deep space too, and interstellar travel is an automatic ability of a Dyson civilization, so they'd probably have colonies nearby and be sending more out all the time. We'd also expect each colony to eventually do the same. Again, no real need for cooperation, even a single O'Neill cylinder could probably manufacture a colony arc ship with just the kind of technologies available to them that we consider on the radar for the next century or so. We have re-examined material I've discussed in other episodes pertaining to Dysons, but I've tried to keep away from those in detail, so those other episodes I've been mentioning will answer a lot of the questions you might have on these things if you haven't seen them yet, but I think we can stop here for today. Hopefully by now you have a clearer image on what these things are and why so many of us tend to take their future existence almost for granted. There are so many reasons to build one, the capability appears to be there, and I've never heard a good reason not to build one. Even if your population plateaus off way short of what you need to fill one of these up, you still have reason to build one. Just collect and store matter and energy to preserve your civilization far longer than the default maximum of about 4 billion years before the sun starts dying. I can imagine a civilization that decides to be zero growth even when it doesn't need to be, 
but I'd still expect them to try to extend their possible existences out longer. Next week we will be looking at that concept, in the long-awaited sequel to Civilizations at the End of Time, where we will look beyond the black hole-based civilizations we looked at there and explore continuing on past the dark black hole era with options such as reversible computing, Boltzmann brains, and Iron Stars. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.